But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, that you arm us with the truth. And thank you, Lord, you've made it accessible to us. And thank you, Lord, for the truth that it conveys and the love that it shows us that, God, no matter what kind of lies or deceptions the enemy has for us on the other side of these doors, that, Lord, we can go forward armed with the knowledge of the truth. May we bask in that truth today. May we be so filled up with it, God, that we may go forward as a witness of that truth. Lord, help me to deliver this. Lord, let, make me just be a vessel for you. In Christ's name, amen. One of the goals I have for Bethlehem Baptist Church is that we would be a healthy, growing, reproducing church. And that first part of it being a healthy church. A healthy church is one that is fed by the word of God. And you might say, well, every church I've ever walked into has Bibles. I'm sure they're being fed by the word of God. It's not necessarily true. What is the litmus test? What is the way that I can know that a church is fed by the word of God? And it is, do they rightly handle the word of God? It is it held in a reverence when it is read and when it is preached from is it is it presented in a way that is not only plain and simple and easy to understand but in a way that its truth is what directs the people the word of god is referred to in ephesians six seventeen as the sword of the spirit and the sword of the spirit does three things for a church the sword of the spirit being handled correctly by the people most specifically by the under-shepherd. The sword of the Spirit protects the sheep. It cuts off the horns of the goat, and it kills the wolves. Wolves try to get in and get after the flock, the sheep. The sheep are to be protected by that sword of the Spirit. The goats, the hard-headed ones, are to have their horns lopped off by it so that they might become sheep, humbled in a way not to dehumanize them, but in a way where they will fall in line and be like the other sheep, simply fed by the shepherd. And for the wolves that try to come around and lead the flock astray, that sword is used to kill and destroy. That is what it means to rightly handle the word of God as not just some book of fables or stories, but that it is the very word of God. And you might say, well, pastor, you're, peeing, you're painting with a pretty broad brush once again. Every uh, church I've been in has Bibles and the pastor typically reads from that Bible. How do I know? What's a, what's a, sure, what's a surefire way I know? I'm going to give you that surefire way today and it's one that we are going to live by. The best way, the easiest way that you can tell how much a church is living by the word of God is how they present salvation. And salvation, if you got a pen, you might want to write this down. If not, I'm going to repeat it several times. Salvation presented by the word of God is this, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. That is what 
salvation is by the very reading of the word of God. And I'll show you in this passage of scripture that we have. That first point though, grace. Salvation is by grace alone. Salvation is a gift from God. It is of God to us. There's a great acronym for grace, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. God gives us salvation as a gift and it is paid for with the price of Christ's blood. But it is at its very genesis, at its very beginning, it is given by God. We see that in verse five of our passage. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And in verse seven of our passage, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In verse eight, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is not something that we earn or that we deserve. Romans 3, 23 and 24 puts it this way. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. God's grace is not something we earn or deserve. We are born in sin. We are guilty of original sin. There's nothing that we could do to ever earn the grace of God. It is simply God pouring out mercy on us that he would have grace and that he would extend grace to a creature that has turned its back on him through the centuries and the millennia that God still in his wonderful, merciful way extends grace to us. The first three verses of Ephesians chapter two, Paul says, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But by verse four, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. By grace, you have been saved. There are some people that preach a message of cheap grace, of free grace. I go back to my acronym. <clears throat> God's riches at Christ's expense. The grace of God is extended to us by the blood of Christ. It is a gift unearned and undeserved, but it is grace we have been saved. By grace we have been saved. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. We talk about faith. What are we talking about? Are we talking about somebody who got tricked or hypnotized? Are we talking about somebody who fell for a good argument or a good story? What faith is, is God's divine persuasion. God speaks to a man's heart in a way that no other thing can and turns his heart toward his maker. It is very distinct <clears throat> from what we call human belief. What human belief is in something is what we refer to as the word confidence. If a man has belief in something in his own strength, it is a confidence. I am confident in my coworker. I'm confident in my family member, I am confident in my friend or in the contractor working on my house. When we talk about faith, we are talking about divine persuasion by God. I've seen people, and you probably have as well, through the years that you beg and you plead and you bring it up 
over and over about Christ and you, you see no change. You see a, like a face like a stone that will not take in what you say. It is because they are in need of a divine persuasion. They are in need of the Holy Spirit to come into their heart and change their way. It is not something man has the power to do. We can put forward our best effort, but salvation is ultimately the outworking of the Holy Spirit changing the heart of a sinner. In Galatians 2, verse 16, it puts it this way. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And in chapter three, verse 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Many Christians throughout the centuries, throughout the times have attached things to faith. <clears throat> and they'll say, well, you got to have faith, but you've also got to do this, this, and this. Works, money, or the right bloodline, having the right bloodline. Do you have the right inheritance? Are you given enough money? Are you doing enough works? I would humbly submit unto you the word of God through the New Testament teaching says that it is not works and not by following the law, but it is by faith alone that a sinner is justified. You are not saved by works. You are saved for works. I don't ever want you to sit here and think if I put in enough time weed eating the yard at the church that that's going to save me. It will not. <clears throat> I don't care how many Sunday school lessons you teach. I don't care how many meals you pay for. Great, good, awesome, wonderful things. But without your faith placed in Christ, you are just as lost as the sinner down the street. Doesn't matter how much work you do here. I'd love for you to come in here and repaint this whole place and pressure wash the outside. But I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say, that's good enough. Out of the old system of the Roman Catholic Church, they would sell things called indulgences, things that would let you get away with sin and you'd be okay. Or if you did enough things for the priests or for the church, if you gave enough money to pay for statues or lecterns or other things, oh, he's good. He's not. She's not. There's no amount of works you can do. If you want to try works, Scripture makes a case for that in Galatians 3.12. Paul says, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Basically, what the word of God says is, if you think you can get there by works, go back to Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Go back through the law and live by the law perfectly. Go ahead and try it. You will fail. You will fail because every person fails. No one can fulfill the law but Christ because we are born sinners. I've met people at certain things that have came up and said, preaching on that sin's fine and dandy, but I don't sin. I can't remember the last time I sinned. Well, God bless your heart. You just sinned right now. You just lied to me and acted like you didn't sin. Well, I've never, I, I haven't broken the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is not the full law. The Ten Commandments is the moral law. Go back through Leviticus. Go back through Deuteronomy. Read the whole thing. You will not fulfill the law. You will fall short. <clears throat> and you will realize real quick why God says in his word in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Because it is by faith, no one has a reason to brag. No one has a reason to sit there and say, look what I did. It's not a measuring contest. It is by faith alone, by grace alone, 
through faith alone. Now we get to the third part. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This gift of salvation that we have is bought and paid for by one, God's only son. This feels like the most basic one there is, that salvation is only in Christ. But you would be amazed at some places that you can walk in and people will teach and preach salvation in multiple ways. You would be amazed at houses of worship that have a cross standing over them where someone will stand in a pulpit or in a Sunday school class and will say that all religions point to heaven. I've met ministers of the faith that say we should extend a nice, warm, welcome hand to Muslims before because they believe in the same God we do. They believe in Jesus like we do. There's only one way unto salvation. It is through Christ. Muslims can believe in Christ, but when you get Christ wrong, you have lost your salvation in it. These work-based Christian-ish cults that prey on recruit, recruiting weak Christians all have the same thing in common. They get Christ wrong. Because <clears throat> Christ is the one in whom salvation is, and it is Christ alone. Galatians 3.13 says it this way. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Christ is the only one who can justify and he is the only one who can sanctify. He is the only mediator we have before a holy God, as I told the kids. God is holy. The Father is holy and righteous. Isaiah says he dwells in the high and holy place. In heaven where he dwells is a holy place. There is no room for sin, no room for disease, no room for anything sinful. You don't get to bring sin with you when you go. We stand before a holy and righteous God and we are unworthy. We only have one mediator. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the witness for this proper time. I don't care how many saints you can recite. Those saints can do nothing for you before God. I don't care how much you love mama or daddy or grandpa or your pastor or your priest. None of them will stand before God and answer for you. None of them will witness before God for you. The most they can do while they are alive is pray for you. But once they are on the other side, it's pointless to pray to them. They're already in glory or they might be in eternity hell depending on where their faith was. But it is Christ who is our mediator. That's why we pray to the Father in the name of the Son because it is the Son who speaks on our behalf. When we stand before the judge, the righteous judge, and we are found guilty, it is Christ who is our mediator. Like our court-appointed uh, attorney, the lawyer, the defendant stands in front of the judge guilty of the sin. And it is the lawyer, the advocate, who stands before the father and says, why should I let him in? Because I paid for his sins, says the son of the most high God. Salvation is in Christ alone. We're over halfway there. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And let me add, let me add one more point on top of that. Christ alone. This is where we lose, where we lose our friends in the Catholic faith. Faith is that word I'm putting on the end of each of these things alone, because you don't get to add on top of these things. Scripture lists them plainly and only. There's no alternatives. 
There's no back road to heaven. It's a one-way path, and it's a narrow path. The wide gate to hell is like a five-lane interstate or those eight-lane interstates they have in California. The way to destruction is broad. It is easy. It is well lit. That path to heaven, it is a narrow path, and straight is the gate. It is a path, unfortunately, that not as many as we would hope would find. But the only salvation is in Christ alone. I know people that pray in the name of Moses, Abraham, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. Sometimes they might throw a disciple in there. Sometimes they might even throw uh, Mary's name in there. You have never wasted your breath more in your life praying in anybody's name other than Christ. And not only are you wasting your time, you are wasting God's time. God will not hear that prayer. Pray to him in Jesus' name. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you can. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Last two verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone. What we hold in our hands, what I'm referring to, scripture, the Bible, the very word of God. Through the centuries, men have sought to subtract from it and to add to it. But here's what it says about itself. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Greek word that is translated as inspiration of God is the word theonoustos, which literally means God breathed. What it literally means to say is that what we read in the text before us is literally God breathed. If you put your hand in front of your face and you breathed on it a couple times, you'd you'd feel the warm sensation of that CO2 that you breathe out. This word is breathed out by God. It is perfect. Jesus in John 17, 17, as he prays for his disciples before he's arrested, he prays to the Father, Lord, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. <coughs> it is not a measuring stick. It is the measuring stick. If it is not found in scripture, I want no part of it. I want no doctrine. I want no rules. I want no idea that is not founded on the word of God. People love to twist and take moral law and say, well, man came up with that. Man is inherently sinful. Man has, man unchecked goes to horrible, sinful places. It is God's law that laid it down and said that murder is wrong and that stealing is wrong and that envy is wrong, that disrespecting, not honoring your parents is Wrong. It, those things are wrong not because men came up with them, but because God's word says they are sinful. They are violations of his law. In Acts 17 is a great story. The apostle Paul was going around preaching. He had been converted. He was preaching the gospel. And he comes to a place in Acts 17, uh, Berea. The people were called the Bereans. And Paul goes preaching the gospel that by Grace through faith in Christ you may be saved. And the Bereans hear him preach. They hear his message. And they say, we have heard what you have said. Let us now go and measure it against the word of God. They had access to scripture. They said, we've heard what you said. We're going to take it and measure it against the scripture to find out whether you are truthful or not. They came back the next day. 
You preach the truth, the Apostle Paul, Brother Paul. But to have that boldness, to be so anchored in the truth that they say, I hear what the pastor says, I hear what the evangelist says. How does it line up against Scripture? That's the way we should all be. You should take no pastor's word for it. You should measure it against the Scripture. That's where people get in trouble in some places where it turns into pastor worship. Well, it's what the pastor said. The pastor should be preaching out of the word of God. He should be teaching out of the word of God. His words and his opinions and his ideas should line up with the word of God. If they don't, he should be called out for them by leadership and eldership. And if he will not repent of those things, he should be left behind or removed. But men typically, unfortunately, get in this position and they go unchecked. People will say, well, I'm not too sure about it, but you know, I trust him. You should trust no man. The word of God you should trust over a man's word. It's why, part of why I record these things. I go back and listen and make sure that I haven't skirted off from the word of God. Because if I have, I need to pray for forgiveness for the sin that I might have deceived somebody just speaking out of my opinion. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone. There's nothing that needs to be added to this word. There are consequences in Revelation for people that add to the word of God. Some people add the Apocrypha, uninspired works. Some people add the Book of Mormon. Some people add false translations. Mercy on your soul for you that work to deceive the children of God, trying to lead the elect astray. And then finally, as we close in, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Turn to Psalm 115 if you can. We're almost done. Psalm 115. There are many places I can take you in scripture that it would say that everything should be done to the glory of God. But it is not just the worship service, not just the preaching, but also in the giving that we do, in the service that we do, in the outreach that we do, in the inreach that we do, in the anything that we do, not just as a church, but as a people. Is it being done to the glory of God? Psalm 115 puts it this way. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy and your truth. Everything that I have listed out leading up to this, none of them are works of man. They're works of God. It is God's grace extended to us. Faith in God is a gift from God. It is his divine persuasion. In Christ, God's very son, his monogonase, his only begotten son. According to scripture, that is God breathed. We would have no scripture without God. So therefore, all that we do and all that is done should be done to the glory of God alone. We have no right to boast, nor should we boast of others. So many places, if you go through Europe, they've become tourist attractions now. They're not houses of God anymore. Great big Gothic cathedrals built on the backs of money given to a church that was selling indulgences, saying if you give enough money, you can get away with this sin. That's how they built those great big buildings up. They are not built to the glory of God. They're built on the back of money stolen from the people by false advice given by preachers and priests who said, you can get away with this if you will just pay the money. That your salvation is not by faith alone, but also add a price tag on it. 
And that's how they built some of those great big buildings. And most of them don't even get worshipped in anymore. They're just museums. Tourists walk through them and have no feeling of the presence of God because God left the place a long time ago before it was probably even built because he was not honored and glorified in those houses. The priests were honored in those places. These are truths that are unpopular. Most places you go in will never, you will never hear a single thing about these things. You might hear about grace and faith, and you might hear about Christ. You might hear a little bit about Scripture, and you might hear a little, a little bit about glory. But when you get down to the alone business, sola gratia, by grace alone, sola fide, by faith alone, solus Christus, by Christ alone, Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Soli Deo Gloria, by the glory, to the glory of God alone. When you add that word alone on there, you lose a lot of the crowd. Because you have completely removed man from the equation. Man is getting no kind of glory from any of this. I get no credit for Scripture. God wrote it. I get no credit for Christ. He is God's only Son. I didn't find Christ. Christ is timeless. He has always been. I get no credit for faith. God gave me faith. God, in his divine persuasion, has persuaded my heart. But what about it's your heart? I wouldn't have a heart if God didn't create me in his image. His grace. I do nothing to earn his grace. I am undeserving of his grace. I am deserving of punishment. But he has extended grace. Therefore, it is he that should be glorified. This is unpopular stuff. C.S. Lewis had a great quote about standing out in the crowd. It says, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And that's a lot of aspects of life right now, I feel like. We feel like we are in a terrible minority where the whole world is running toward the cliff of death. We talked about it last week, how it is those that are dwelling and living intentionally in sin are literally worshiping death. And it seems like they've got so much of a majority. We feel like sometimes we're the only one in a crowd of people They're all heading toward the cliff. The whole world running toward a cliff. He who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. It's kind of funny. A lot of these guys that not too long ago were considered conspiracy theorists, all of a sudden are coming up 100% on a lot of them conspiracy theories. And people are starting to wake up and they're starting to realize we've been lied to about a whole lot of things. Now, I would say, when it comes to salvation, we have been lied to a lot. We have been lied to and led to believe we are such a great and wonderful person because we walk the aisle and confess Christ. We've been led to believe that, oh, what a, what a great and wondrous set of parents we must have had. Those things play important roles. But every aspect of our salvation is a work of God. Let us run not for the sake of being different, but let us run because we are a part of the true church. It is the true church that gets raptured out in 1 Thessalonians. It is the true church that God pulls out of this earth before the real tribulation comes on. It is the true church that gets rescued and pulled out as the rest of the world heads on off that cliff with a smile on its face. And they will one day see the just and righteous God. And it will be the worst wake-up call of all time. I pray that something, some kind of effort, some kind of thing that we can do, that we can be a vessel for God, that we might be used by him 
to lead someone unto salvation so they would not see that and deal with that. But the truth of the matter is a lot will. May we go down swinging, being called crazy because we build our lives on the truth of God's word. That salvation was not some great thing that we did or some great thing that the pastor did or the priest did or that the deacon at the church did or somebody at vacation Bible school did, but that the person that was standing before you was simply being an instrument used by God. May we seek to be that instrument for future generations to come. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to our sermon. You can come visit us at 2333 Whispering Pines Road, Danville, Virginia. We're Bethlehem Baptist Church. Our Sunday worship is at 11 a.m. And if you don't already have a church home, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much for listening in and hope that you have a blessed day.